Hi there. Uh, in this video, we're going to talk about what are called inverses of trigonometric equations. And you're already familiar with this word inverse and the notion of an inverse operation. This is probably vocabulary you heard in Algebra 1 or pre-algebra. An inverse operation is when we undo some other mathematical operation. So for example, you know, we could ask, what is the inverse operation of, oops, get my pointer, of adding 8, right? I can add 8 to a number. How do I undo the addition of 8? We undo the addition of 8 by subtracting 8. Subtraction undoes addition. What about dividing by 3? The way we undo dividing by 3, of course, is by multiplying by 3. Multiplication and division essentially are the same thing in opposite orders. One of them undoes the other one. Right? What if we square a positive number? Right? 5, if I square the number 5, I get 25. Right. Is there a way of undoing that and sending 25 back to 5? Yeah, that's the square root. So many mathematical operations, we can do them, and then we can undo them in the other order. That's known as an inverse operation. Sometimes when we're getting a little more technical, we call it an inverse function. So we want to apply the same idea to trig functions. So let's look at an example. If I say that cosine of 2 pi over 3 is equal to negative 1 half, right, let's visualize this in terms of our unit circle. Draw rough unit circle in my axes. I know that 2 pi over 3 looks something like so. There's my angle. Here's my point. And this is basically saying when I take the angle of 2 pi over 3, I get the x-coordinate, let me make my writing a little bit smaller, I get an x-coordinate, right, my cosine value of negative one-half. So let's really think about this as input and output. I have this function cosine. In goes an angle, and out comes an x-coordinate, the cosine value. That's how cosine works. We plug in an angle and we get a number representing a, an x-coordinate. Well, what if we want to reverse that? To reverse that, we would switch the role of input and output. And we can reverse that with something called inverse cosine. So here you see inverse cosine. The way we write inverse cosine is cosine with a superscript of negative 1. Inverse cosine reverses the relationship. We start with the cosine value. Right, so this is the cosine value. And then this is the corresponding angle. So I've already shown you the answer here, but one way to think about this, right? what if we just saw the left-hand side of this equation? If I saw that, I would want to think, oh, this is cosine, but it's cosine inverse. This is a backwards version of cosine. When I'm doing a backwards version of cosine, I want to think to myself that this right here is not the angle, but it's actually the answer from cosine. So the way we would think about this is basically it is if the answer or value of cosine is negative one-half, what was the angle? We're reversing it. When we do regular cosine, we take cosine of an angle, and the answer is a number representing the x-coordinate. When we do inverse cosine, we're starting with the cosine value. I already know that cosine is equal to negative one-half. And I'm asking, what's the angle that gave that to me? And it's 2 pi over 3. Right? It's not a coincidence that it's the same numbers. In this version, we take an input of 2 pi over 3 to get an answer of negative one-half.
In this version, we take an input of negative 1 half to get an answer of 2 pi over 3. That's the idea. So on this next page, what I want you to do first is for each of these, just think, what does this mean? Right? What is the meaning of these expressions? This one is what's called inverse cosine. This one is inverse sine. This one is inverse tangent. It's trig but backwards. So ask yourself what these mean. Then see if you can come up with what is the answer. Hit pause to do this. Okay, so for this first one, it's cosine. We're basically thinking to ourselves, cosine of which angle is equal to root 2 over 2? We already know what cosine is. What we don't know is the angle. And hopefully you remember that this is a familiar number from the unit circle. And you might say to yourself, oh, well, that happens when cosine is 45 degrees or pi over 4, depending upon whether we're doing this in radians or degrees. I started with what cosine was, and my answer is the angle. Same relationship, but in reverse. This one's sine. For this one, we're saying to ourselves, oh, I'm taking sine of some angle. Which angle? What is the angle where when I take its sine, I get root 3 over 2? Hopefully you remember root 3 over 2 is that number that's almost 1. So this is saying our y-coordinate is almost 1. And hopefully you remember, if we have an angle like this, 60 degrees or pi over 3, depending upon whether we're doing it in degrees or radians, that's the corresponding angle. I'm usually going to answer these in radians, sometimes in degrees. Inverse tangent of negative 1. So this is basically saying tangent of which angle is equal to negative 1. And we know tangent is sine over cosine. So basically, if tangent is equal to negative 1, this means sine and cosine are opposites. So this might be a little bit harder to think about, but if we look in the fourth quadrant, for example, and that's not perfect, but good enough, and we take something like theta equals negative pi over 4, hopefully you remember that cosine of that value is positive root 2 over 2, sine of that is the same but negative. So if we were to divide those two numbers, we'd just get negative 1. This is equal to negative pi over 4. Now, we do need to be a little bit careful. We did inverse sine of root 3 over 2. Let's go back here. Right? I drew this diagram. But I could, theoretically, have drawn a diagram where there's my unit circle. Let's draw our y-axis and x-axis. And maybe I could have drawn a picture like this. There's another pretty familiar angle where that y-coordinate is root 3 over 2. Maybe we're getting that y-coordinate in the first quadrant. Maybe we're getting it in the second quadrant. In this second example, it would be 120 degrees or 2 pi over 3. In either case, it's a correct answer to this question. What is the angle that gives us a sine value of root 3 over 2? Well, maybe that angle is pi over 3. Maybe that angle is 2 pi over 3. Maybe there are even more answers. So this is where we have to get a little bit technical. If you notice there's more than one po possible answer to this question, we have to pick one. Sine inverse is what's known as a function. Functions give us unique answers. So we kind of have to just decide when it feels like there's more than one possible answer, what's the answer we give. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about it. Um, but here is the gist of it. We want to give the best answer. Uh -oh, so 
We want to give the best possible answer. And I'll give you more details, but here's how you pick the best answer. For our purposes, the best answer is the one closest to zero. So to go back here, right, our choices were 60 degrees or 120 degrees. This is the one that's closest to zero. So this is the answer we give. Now, sometimes maybe things are equally close to zero. Right, back for this example, in theory, maybe someone would have drawn a picture like so, where instead of drawing a 45 degree angle, they drew a negative 45 degree angle. That gives us the same value of cosine. It still makes this equation true. If I plug in 45 degrees, I get root three, 2 over 2 over cosine. If I plug in negative 45 degrees, I get root 2 over 2 over cosine. So how do I pick between 45 and negative 45? They're equally close to 0. So the second part of this is if there's a tie, right? If there's a positive angle and a negative angle that are equally good, we'll just pick the positive one. So you'll practice this, but you really just want to think, what is the angle that makes this true? Can I come up with one that's close to zero? Maybe that means it's a small positive angle or it's a small negative angle, but we want a pretty small angle. We don't want 425 degrees or anything crazy like that. You want to pick something as close to zero as possible. And if it feels like there's a tie, oh, this could be 60 degrees or negative 60 degrees, just pick the positive one. That way, we're always giving a specific answer to these questions. So let's just look at a little summary of how these things work. And I'm going to be talking about this word domain. Domain is the fancy mathematical term for all of the acceptable input values for a function. And range is the word for all the output values. So let's just go over these. Cosine. For cosine, my input can be any angle, no matter what angle you're thinking of right, 2,012 degrees. We can find 2,012 degrees and ask what is the cosine. So anything is acceptable input. But we know cosine measures an x-coordinate on the unit circle, and the unit circle is not particularly big. So whenever we do cosine, no matter what we plug in, we're getting an answer that's somewhere between negative 1 and 1. What that means is when we go to inverse cosine and we're reversing that relationship, it only makes sense to ask inverse cosine questions when we have something that could be a cosine value. What angle gives me this cosine value? Well, that's really only a relevant question when I have something that could be a cosine value, somewhere between negative 1 and 1. Then the answer will be an angle. And I'll just tell you, if you follow the rule of pick the one closest to zero and break any tie with a positive, you'll always get an answer between zero and pi. So this would be quadrant one and quadrant two. That's just how that works out if you use that rule. Closest to zero and pick a positive if there's a tie. Inverse cosine always gives you an answer between zero and pi. Between zero and 180 degrees if you're using degrees. Sine is similar. I can take sine of any angle I like. The answer will be somewhere between negative 1 and 1 because we know sine measures a y-coordinate on the unit circle. And the unit circle is not big. The lowest is negative 1, the highest is 1. When I undo sine with inverse sine, I have to be dealing with a number between negative 1 and 1. And if I follow that rule about find the answer closest to zero, I'll always be getting something between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So either it's a small angle in the first quadrant, or it's a small angle in the fourth quadrant. Let me make that a little bit better. That's a Roman numeral 4. For tangent, we can take tangent for everything except odd multiples of pi over 2. Right, occasionally, tangent is undefined because it would involve dividing by zero. We haven't explored this too much, but it turns out when you do tangent, your output could be anything. 
If you are clever enough, you can find a value of tangent that is 47.3 or negative one-fifth or anything like that. All numbers are possible. So what that means is when we reverse tangent, inverse tangent could start with anything, right? I could say, hey, what's inverse tangent of 5.8? And that question makes sense. I'm basically asking which angle theta gives 5.8 as my answer for tangent. I'm not saying I know that answer off the top of my head, but I'm saying that question makes sense. If the value of tangent is 5.8, what angle did I start with? And if we follow that same rule of pick the answer closest to zero, we're also going to get something in quadrant one or quadrant four, somewhere between negative pi over two and pi over two. And you might notice that the inequalities are slightly different. Here, it'll never be equal but it's the same basic idea. All right, I'm gonna break up this video and pause this here.